Welcome to the show, Sports and Hip Hop with DJ Mad Max, Mad Max Radio Live 365. We have the one and only DJ Wonder. Hey, man, what's happening? Mad Max, baby, Mad Max. (laughs) We're looking for the water. The water. Uh, There's no water (laughs) left on Earth. Only Mad Max has the key. He roams the (laughs) desert lands looking for Uh, water. I like your background. Oh, crap. Let me turn some of this off. I didn't. Well, I guess you can see now I'm doing a, a new podcast called Complete Animals. So this is kind of the Complete Animals, whatever. I'll leave it up. Uh, uh, that's, that's the name of the podcast. So that's what. T- that's tell us it. about it. We could start off with that. Tell us about the new podcast. Uh, well, you know, I've been, I, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but I'm in a DJ crew called uh, Animal Status. Mm-hmm. And um, this is kind of the, the name of, of the podcast is kind of a spinoff on that. And, you know, being an animal, it's just, it comes from like party animals or just being an, a savage animal person in general. Um, and that's kind of like what the podcast entails, just like what happens, my opinions on topical issues, uh, what I did this weekend, what, what clubs are popping and wherever I'm at, um, Instagram models come through, whatever, whatever, it's just stuff like that. And uh, also we have guests usually in the music industry or some of my friends or just people that I think are interesting people in general um, and just talk about uh, their lifestyle. And usually I surround myself with nothing but animals and that's why it's called <laughs> animal status. Let's start all the way back at the beginning. Tell me your experience of growing up in Maryland because it's different from growing up in New York in a way. Yeah, I wish I grew up in Maryland. I grew up in Delaware though. Which is oh, you grew up in, it was, it's Delaware, okay. <laughs> uh, but Nah, I actually did basically grew up in Maryland because I would always be in Salisbury, Maryland at the mall. Salisbury Mall represent also Ocean City, Maryland. People might know that who are vacation down there. I'm very close to Ocean City uh, where I grew up. I grew up at the beach area, Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, Georgetown, Delaware um, was the official town that I grew up in. Um, but Ocean City is where a lot of people from Philly and D.C. and that area, they come to vacation. So they know kind of like where I was uh, raised. But um, yeah, man, it, it was a beach community and also agricultural like farming community so it was like a bunch of like rural areas and then it would be beach so you'd have like seasonal visitors from uh different cities and stuff so it was all a mix of different types of people it was cool it was a i i enjoy it much more coming back home now i wanted to leave so bad when i lived there so i left when i was 17 to go to new york city i want to go to the big city baby and get out of there but now that i've uh now that I've been in the city for a long time, it feels good to come back home. And I could probably maybe see myself living there one day. We'll see. But that's usually what, what happens with most of the people around me. They all came back. They all can usually end up working for my high school. They, my high school, for some reason, drew all of us back for some reason. They all became teachers or like uh, principals and stuff. I don't know, man. We're, 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 I guess we're like we're stuck on that era. We never want to leave high school or middle school. I'll tell you what. I wish that I was able to travel more, especially to – Baltimore, Maryland, because I enjoyed going there when I was younger, hanging out at the harbor. That's where it's at. Yeah, man, that's the only place we went because guess what? Right outside of Inner Harbor, you didn't want to be past 7 p.m., baby. I tell you that much. <laughs> Even outside of Camden Yards, you don't want to be roaming around in the 90s. I tell you that. But uh, yeah, Baltimore, that's basically one of the only cities I really did visit with my parents growing up. They hated the cities. We went to Florida, we went to Disney World every year. That was like vacation. But if I could get them to go to a city, I'd like them, I'd like to go explore. And that's one of the cities we went to. We used to go watch Orioles games all the time. Nice hat you got there, buddy. Oh, thank and, you. <laughs> uh, so I never really went to Philadelphia. They didn't, definitely not New York, even though my my father's side, they were born up in, in that area, like Hackensack, New Jersey, Yonkers, New York. Um, but they, we never visited the northern part. So Baltimore is about the closest I ever had to visiting cities as a kid. With growing up in Delaware, of course, who did you listen to on the radio that may have inspired your passion from wanting to get into the broadcasting and DJ and business? Yeah, man, we like my area, the beach area, we didn't really have a mix show DJ that was really like popping. Um, it was all syndicated, like mega mix, like mix shows where it would be like corny, like this is how we do it. And then it had like a, a slick Rick, um, like sample over it that, that every DJ had. It's almost the same thing now, like record pools with like hype intros and stuff like that. But they would play that kind of, it was like a seamless thing that somebody had put together, like um, prepackaged. It wasn't like live and like people messing up a little bit or whatever, just this, like any, no kind of flavor whatsoever. It was very cookie cutter. Um, so, and then or like my school dances, there was a guy named DJ force one who lived in the apartments in Georgetown, Delaware, white guy lived in the apartments, one of the only white guys around there, but he had a big old blazer that said force one on the back of it. And he used to do our school dances. Um, also our home economics teacher, her husband did our middle school dances. And that, and that guy really kind of inspired me 
um, because middle school music was the music that basically shaped my life, probably in most people's lives. That's when you start really getting into music. Um, so those are the two guys, I guess, before I, radio that I was interested in. But then when I started really listening to radio, I'll go upstate, go to the mall, like Dover Mall, Dover, Delaware. Um, and you get to hear Philadelphia stations like Power 99, like Cosmic Kev, a couple other guys um, from when you really got to hear like a mix show. And then people would also bring tapes from New York, like Funkmaster Flex and Tony Touch, Doo Wop, um, all these guys. And you'd hear those, the mixtapes. And that's what really got me on. But Funkmaster Flex, I guess, was my a person that I looked up to just because he was most accessible. I'd see him on MTV. I would VHS uh, record certain shows on MTV just so I could rewind it and see techniques. He was like cutting up like firm, the firm phone tap and stuff like that, like random records and just to see how he did it and what the style was. Um, and that was my first kind of intro to DJing, I guess. How'd you feel about the firm with full circle on Nas's new album, King's Disease? I like it. I, I wish nature would have been on there. I don't know if, yeah. I don't know if nature, I don't know if nature is like talking at the end. There's somebody talking at the end. I don't Dr. Know Dre, I think. Oh, it's Dre. That's right. Yeah. No nature, but they brought back Cormega. That's the, it was, Cormega was supposed to be on there, man, but Def Jam messed him up. Um, so it was cool. I, I like that. Finally that, but you know, Foxy does, can't hear everybody's moved on in, in their lives. That's just what happens. We, we want nostalgia so much. At least I do. But No, I do too. I'm not a big fan of the music scene out here. I think a lot of it's, it's garbage. That's what I call it. But because I'm so, I'm such a purist when it comes to hip hop and you know, you grew up during that time. So you probably feel some sort of way about it, but may not let it show because you are in the radio business and you have to give an audience to, for these young guys that are out here and play the music. But I totally understand what's what's going on out here. And it's it's a shame where hip hop is, but then you gotta look at it. There's still artists that keep it real with Griselda and Dave East, and there's still lyrical artists out here that keep the culture going. Yeah, man. Uh there's but it's it's weird. It's like what what defines somebody as like keeping it real or keeping it like authentic or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, do you have to sound like have a beats from the nineties? And I think you do. I don't care what anybody says. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? like <laughs> Most people are like, oh, no, nah, man, like the, you, you don't want to sound like anybody else. You just do your own thing and it'll shine through. But most of the things that shine through is like lyrical and like just good hip hop usually sound like it was made between like 94 to 97, 98. You know what I mean? And that's just what it is. Even like the like I loved it that back in, in, the, in the mid 90s, like most artists had to no matter where you were from, if you're a Bama from like, you know, outside of Atlanta or something and you wanted to make it into hip hop, you had to sound like a New York artist and you had to travel to New York and get signed by a record label, which is located in New York City. And you had to kind of fit in, you had to assimilate to that New York style, or you had to be, you had, if you were from the Midwest, you had to do that West Coast style. Or if you're from like some other, you stay closer to the West Coast, you had to do the West Coast style. But then even New York's and like B.I.G.'s first album had a lot of like Dr. Dre inspired sounding tracks, but th that was basically it. You had the East Coast sound or you had the West Coast sound. And then all these now that down south, like starting like with Little John, well, actually starting with the the Ha remix mm -hmm. of Juvenile and Jay Z, and they started playing that on Hot 97. That kind of like changed the shape of and the I, little did they know they were destroying their own market by playing yeah. that record <laughs> uh, on, in mix shows. It's like, hey, guess what? You guys are going to be irrelevant in about uh, 10 years by playing this. So I don't know if you really want to introduce this into the scenes like give them a little taste of the old crack baby because now they're always going to want this uh country music everywhere across the country atlanta strip club music is just ruling everywhere and uh now there's no more new york scene unless you want drill which is copying chicago and copying london so that's the only thing really popping out of new york right now it's weird man i don't know i agree I mean, with you on that buffalo buffalo i guess is the real like new york sound not even new york city buffalo yeah. guys are doing it so <laughs> who knows man Oh, uh, it's it's whack out here. The New York hip hop scene is whack out here. You have copycats. If that that wouldn't that wouldn't fly back in the day, you had to sound where you came from. And even you said that you kind of had to sound like a New York rapper if you were down south a little bit to make those record labels and to get signed by those labels out here. But back to you, Wonder. When did you receive your first pair of turntables? My first turntables. Yes, the government issued me my first pair of turntables. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Um. When I was in dun, 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 going into a senior in high school, I and so before that, I had like I, I had like played around on turntables like since I was probably like nine years old. I took a class at a community college, and the guy let us mess with the turntables, whatever. So that was my first like taste scratching and everything, um, or my attempts at scratching. And then 
my high school had a pair of techniques that nobody used from like 1986, probably that they were just sitting and collecting dust. So I assembled those and um, would mess with those during lunch periods and stuff. So I'd already like had a taste for it. And then I finally got a pair, but they were belt driven. They were whack compared to techniques, but that's kind of like what helped me like learn touch and everything on turntables is using belt drive turntables. Um, and that was like, yeah, my, like junior going into senior year of high school. Crazy. And then that's how DJ Wonder was born. And how did you get the name Wonder? Originally, I was DJ Delaware and I was in college. Like, I needed a name. And so it was like <laughs> D-E-L-A-W-H-E-R-E, like where, you know what I mean? Delaware, because a lot of people call me that because I was one of the only people from Delaware that they knew in school. I went to school in Hofstra University, Long Island, New York, baby. Um, Wayne Corbett. Yeah, Wayne Corbett. That's right. He was I, he used to uh, prowl our lunch campus for young 18 year old freshmen or 18 to 22 year old just whoa that's cr- wow I didn't know well, he, wasn't that. That old. he wasn't that old at the time he had just Uh-oh. like he had just graduated <laughs> and he was at, playing on the jets but like well, the jets uh practiced during the summer on our campus so they would just come on through at lunchtime you like any any good looking girl was a rap for that um but <laughs> Yeah, man. So they call me Delaware. Like, you know, they do that a lot of colleges, wherever you're from, they call you that. And uh, so that was what it, what it originally was. And then when I went to Hot 97, my boss, uh, Reggie Hawkins, and also Miguel Candelaria, who was the producer for Star and Buck Wild Show, um, they call me Wonder Bread, like, you know, because I was one of the only white people there at Hot 97. And it just got shortened to DJ Wonder. Mm-hmm. Did you ever feel some sort of way about being called that name that you just said right now, being in the radio industry? Or do you feel as though, is it tough for a, a white person to really be accepted in the hip hop culture, you think? Mm, I, back then, I thought it was like, um, it was cool. It was like a badge of honor. It was like, I don't care, whatever, make fun of white people. But now everybody gets offended by everything. I feel like I should be offended too. I should, <laughs> I should sue now for how I was treated back then. I don't get my own month. I don't get anything. I get nothing, no, no kind of, uh, you know, nothing for, for, for my whiteness in hip hop. So maybe I should feel offended. No, I don't care, man, whatever. It's funny. Um, I don't like it now when people like slam dunk on like races of like, or, like white people in general. Like every joke is acceptable if you're making fun of white people. I think that's corny as hell. So I'll definitely fire back. You know, it's not a big deal to me. Um, but in general, I think people are just very uh, fragile right now. So whatever. yeah, we live in the safe space era. For sure. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Trust me about that. At your time at Hot 97 or just anywhere in general, who was someone that served as a mentor to you in the industry in your early days? Yeah, definitely Reggie Hawkins. Um, he was uh he was the uh what was it called Not, music director for hot 97 program director was tracy clarity who i worked under and she was like the person that kind of shaped hot 97 into what it was known as as the hip-hop station this was before power 105 there was no competition in new york city it was hot 97 you had wbls and you had 98.7 which were two r&b stations so this was the only hip-hop station at the time and she changed it from like, or not her specifically, but she was the one that overlooked everything that changed when it changed from the dance station to a hip hop station. Um, and he worked at, under her as the music director. And he also produced the Star and Buck Wild morning show. And so I came, worked under him. He got me on Star and Buck Wild as like, just like an intern assistant um, and kind of helped me with my career. And then also eventually he left to go do serious radio um, and then they started the Eminem channel, Shade 45, and they needed a producer. And he uh, kind of like called on me to do that because he knew, I guess I had capabilities of doing it or whatever. So I really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, he definitely guided my career for sure. Mm-hmm. And also like some of the DJs over there, like Mr. C was always cool with me. Um, like Angie Martinez was cool. Uh, Sonny Anderson, who's on the like Food Network now, she was always good with me. Um, pretty much everybody over there was, was uh, they helped me out a lot for sure. What was it like working over there Hot 97 and especially probably getting it on air at times? Uh, yeah, man. I mean, I really wanted to DJ on there, but I'm, it wasn't time for me. I definitely would have messed up and it would, probably would have like cuss words go over <laughs> the air and everything else. Who knows? But um, yeah, I definitely talked a lot on the, the morning show. Um, it was, uh, it, it was, it was like a new experience, man. I'm like young kid from Delaware who had never met any like celebrities. Oh, I mean, the only celebrity I met growing up was like MC Brains at Waxy Maxies in Salisbury Mall. Most people don't even know who MC Brains is. He has a song called 
uh, Uchi Kuchi, La La La. Um, you should look that up. <laughs> I, I don't think he might have been part of the whole uh, Bill Bib DeVoe uh, family or something like that. Who knows? Anyway, uh, so I'm like thrown into this environment um, and I'm getting to meet all of my like heroes growing up, whether it's DJs or just celebrities in general, like walking next to like Justin Timberlake in the hallway or like Pharrell meeting Kanye West when he, you know, just a producer before he started rapping, like uh, Anita Baker, my favorite singer ever, uh, James Brown, I got to meet James Brown, J-Lo when she was dating Ben Affleck, just walking by me, skin glowing, looking beautiful. You know what I'm saying? Like, and Ben are first back, I'm hearing. I know. It feels like I'm, it feels like I'm back in the clubs for the very first time <laughs> back in the day baby it feels good um so it, it was definitely like a crazy experience and then it's the reason why I in new york city man it's the reason why i put up with terrible quality quality of life and got no sleep whatsoever literally slept three hours a day probably for that entire time um but i didn't care i was just like eating it up it was it was crazy like each day was an adventure so, yeah, I loved it, man. Going over to Satellite Radio, what were some of the key differences that you've noticed during your time there from being at Satellite Radio, Sirius XM, from being on FM Radio at Hot 97? Uh, Hot 97 is, was owned by, or is owned by Emmis uh, Communications. And so there was only three stations in the building at the time. Uh, and it was a very, like, kind of family-oriented environment serious is much more corporate when i went over i mean you know a lot more amenities and stuff like that and like the waiting room is like glass and all this other stuff the first time i came there i'm like wow it's like a real like business you know what i mean i didn't kind of know what that environment was like um but it's cool man it's like uh it, serious is i get my job done and kind of like bounce but there's opportunities to kind of work within different genres as well which there wasn't really a hot 97 it was all very urban um, here, there's everything. There's comedy, there's, um, you know, rock, there's the EDM side. We have like Aoki and Diplo have channels on there and stuff. I've had, you know, been able to work on that, on Diplo's channel and other channels like that. Uh, Howard Stern came, uh, I've been on Howard Stern's show before, which I never thought in a million years I would ever be on. Um, so it's, it definitely opened up a lot more doors being in an environment where there's so many different types of people and different genres of music that you're working with every day. Since you were on the Howard Stern show, did he make you feel uncomfortable in some sort of way? Because we know what he does with his guests. He's a legend in doing it. But did you ever feel some sort of way? <laughs> He's, he said I had a black, like a black scent. And I guess I, I guess you could consider it that back then. Let me see if I can find the actual drop from him. Talk for a second and I'm going to look it up and I'll play it for you what he said. Perfect. Yeah, DJ Wonder is going to be finding us the drop for his time at Howard Stern's show, which is interesting. I didn't even know that he was on the show, but it's not hard to imagine because he's in the same building, same company, Sirius XM. We are live here with the one and only DJ Wonder. All right, I think I got it here. Let's see if it works here. Wonder, who's a white guy. Yeah, we wonder yeah. how he got like this. Yeah, that's why his name's Wonder. <laughs> wonder we, we wonder when he started talking black. <laughs> oh, come on, no. There you go. That's, that's cringy. That's, That's typical Howard Stern, though. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, hardcore Howard, baby. It was, yeah. it, that was a very daunting experience going into a studio because, usually, you know, if you've come up to Sirius, we're not even allowed to walk on, you know, that side of the building. He has, it like, his own security and everything else. So it was cool being able to check it out, this, the studio and everything. Tell me your story of the first time that you were the DJ for Sway in the Morning. Hmm. Well, I was already the DJ on shade 45 before that for two previous or one previous morning show um so cypher sounds is the, was the first morning show on shade 45 and obviously he's a dj so he was the dj for his own morning show after he left he went to go do the morning show on hot 97 angela yee who is the person doing our celebrity stuff um took over as the host and i started djing under her and then she left and went to go to power 105 she does the breakfast club now um with charlemagne and envy and then um I kind of did the show a little bit by myself and this guy Farragut Foster um, before Sway came in. And so I had already been, I kind of knew the format and had been doing it pretty much every day. And Sway allowed me to uh, continue that when he started his show. And it was cool, man. It's, it's definitely been fun being, you know, while I was doing it, uh, got it, you know, I was able to integrate new genres of music, which most people in Shade 45 usually don't hear. And definitely during no other time slot do you hear stuff that I play. So I thought it was pretty funny to do that. And yeah. Uh, and I've been not fired yet, so I guess it was. <laughs> <laughs> cool. 
It's always a good thing. Uh, it's always a good thing. Wh- who do you think spit the craziest freestyle on Sway in the morning? Craziest. Well, we did that blew you away because there's been a lot of MCs on there. Yeah, man. I I, I love anybody that I feel like is just uh, on top of it. You like, especially if I know they're coming off the top of the head. Even like Snoop Dogg is very, very good at just like off the top of the head, crazy. Method Man, um, and Black Thought uh are was a very memorable one um but we did a thing called five fingers of death which originally started as me playing five different beats and i was originally doing as five in different genres i would pick a traditional like boom bap beat to kind of like ease them into it then i would go um to like a 70 bpm like dubstep or like really go like low or like double time like house track and then i would play some like soft rock like or uh sometimes country and then end with something that they could like do well with again, but, or like a rock song or something like that at the end. Um, and that a lot of people couldn't do it. They didn't, they didn't have the skills to kind of adjust with the tempo of the song as the tempo would adjust. But the person, a couple of people that did do it, like Papoose, look up Papoose, Five Fingers of Death, uh, King Los, um, look up Kendrick Lamar and like Schoolboy Q, Five Fingers. That's pretty funny, but I don't know if they did that well on it, but it was pretty funny. Um, just look up any five fingers of death on uh, YouTube, Sway in the Morning, and you'll you'll see some people that you might not think can rap like really good. Like Chadis Gambino is really good. Um, yeah, man, I'd have to even look through the list. I don't even know how many people we've like had freestyle on the show. It's it's crazy, bro. It's crazy. It's insane. It's hip hop history, and we always gotta make sure that we're keeping track of it and keeping it, making sure that people are up on their hip hop history because I feel as though hip hop can be a lost genre at times, especially for the youth. They don't even know what '80s hip hop sounded like. I mean, they probably wouldn't even understand it if you played it for them. They, they're hip-hop so out of touch. Month. You know that it's hip hop history month, or hip hop hip hop history week? Excuse me, not hip hop history month. The third week in May is Hip Hop History Week. Just so you know, <laughs> I don't think go, learn your history this week. Make sure you get your studies in. No yeah, they they, 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 they better because they they need to learn this stuff. Maybe the music the music will be better eventually if they learn their history. I think so. I would love for some of these like drill guys to insert like a you know like a like a vocal sample from something from like the early '80s or something or like you know what I mean. I think anytime that any beat kind of like falls back on something from the past and innovates it in a certain way, I think it is dope. And I think people respond to it because deep down inside, they may have heard their parents or in this generation, their grandparents like playing it. You know what I mean? So who knows? It's, it usually works out. For them. It's a good piece of advice for you young rappers out there. Yeah, <laughs> of course. If you know DJ Wonder, you know, he's also involved with EDM. Where did that connection come from? Especially you being mostly hip hop based. Yeah, man, well, any type of, like, EDM that, are, like, has some kind of hip-hop element to it. You, I love stuff with, like, sample drums or, like, like I said, like a, a vocal sample or something from a hip-hop record or whatever. That's my favorite type of, like, EDM. I'm not really, like, a progressive house, like, you know, a Vici guy or Geta or, like, Tiesto or whatever. Um, but I love, I grew up on kind of, like, Baltimore club music, which was around, like, where, where I grew up as well. And then, which eventually turned into Jersey Club. I mean, there still is Baltimore Club, but most people know Jersey Club now. Um, and that's, I kind of got, like, really into a more up-tempo scene, I would call it, more so than, like, an EDM scene. And then kind of, like, being uh, friends with a lot of these guys on this bulletin board called the Holler Board um, during the mid-2000s, which was on. Diplo had a group called Hollertronics um, with low budget and low budget had a bulletin board on his website called the Holler board. And we would trade records. You would hear new stuff. And that's how I kind of got into that scene in general. I kind of like the more alt scene rather than the Euro like house scene. It's more like American Detroit techno kind of like Chicago house uh, and Baltimore club scene, I guess. Before we get into this other genre of music, I want to cover complete animals and animal status because you said we were going to get into that before. It's time to get into it. Tell us about the show, how it came about, and where you got the ideas from. Okay, so animal status. Um, so animal status was a crew, me and uh, DB, and DB also works on Sway in the Morning, and we, you know, we used to wild out crazy, um, and just as friends or whatever, and going out. But then eventually, we decided that we might as well start DJing together. Um, and we came across the name Animal Status because that's basically what we turned into. It was like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde after about 10 Red Bull Vodkas, which we called Mind Erasers. So the good old animals, we became animals, Animal Status. Um, and so I took that uh, and then 
made that the name of my radio show that I started on uh, Shade 45. So that's every Wednesday night, 10 p.m. Eastern on Shade 45. And uh, it kind of, the show itself, it kind of revolves around that theme. It's very, like a lot of hardcore music, um, a lot of like horrorcore, no. hardcore, but horrorcore. Um, also like the EDM influence, like it could be some kind of like trap remixes, EDM trap remixes of stuff. And I was kind of playing that on the radio pretty much before anybody else, according to Flostradamus. Not, I didn't say that. Flostradamus told me that. I was one of the first DJs to play that stuff. Um, and that was around 2011, 2012. Um, so yeah, man, uh, that's kind of like what the radio show is. And then now, like I said, this podcast, which will be launching uh, this Friday on uh all platforms and also mixcloud.com slash dj wonder dj wonder.com slash complete animals all that youtube.com slash dj wonder if you want to see what the actual podcast looks like it's also being videotaped um that's kind of a culmination of the lifestyle of uh animal status so not just the music everything and the animal lifestyle i guess is what it is it, the the under the underline of it if you had like a byline or underneath of the uh, title would be the complete guide to never growing up all right because i am living peter pan lifestyle and i plan on continuing that peter pan lifestyle unless some fine woman can snap me out of it which i don't think will happen <laughs> we'll see, man. i don't know oh man congrats on the shows though and in the new podcast we'll be looking forward to it you know where i'm going to be heading with this now because i'm also a horror fan and that's why this was going to be an interesting discussion no matter what you you based the promos on horror movies i saw you posted the the dream warriors freddy on there for the episode upcoming now on your instagram but when did your love of horror start i think this week is Nightmare on Elm Street 1. I don't think it's Dream Warriors. I don't that which is Nightmare on Elm Street 3. I think it's from Nightmare on Elm Street 1, just so you know. Okay. But uh yeah, and by the way, Dream Warriors is my favorite Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Um, because it's the one that mentally scarred me the most growing up. And why was that? I don't know, because maybe it was the first one that I could really understand as a child. Like the rest of them were like a little bit too early for me. But then Dream Warriors was really like, yo, this is too much. And then also uh Nightmare on My Street. Um, Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff oh, yeah. Will Smith, came out yeah. and really blew up, um, you know, Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street in general. It was, it was still, it was big before that, but that it made it very mainstream when there, when a couple of rap songs came out about it. That one and also, uh, are you ready for Freddy? Ready for ready Fat for Boys. Freddy, Fat Boys. That's right. You got it, man. Um, so yeah, that scarred me. But why do I, what was the question again? Why do I use that imagery for promoting animals? Oh, no, no. When did your love of horror begin? Oh, okay. Uh, back then, man, like as a child, like, so I, my parents were always, always working. So I would always stay at my aunt's house and she watched night, uh, Friday the 13th, like uh, Halloween, like Nightmare on Elm Street, all like horror movies that would come out. So I would be seeing those late nights and, and the making a thriller. I saw the making a thriller, Michael Jackson, uh, as a child. And that definitely scarred me as well. Um, but in a good way. And I guess I've always stuck to that. And it's my favorite genre of movie is horror. My favorite movie ever is scream, which most like horror buffs will kind of like laugh at, but I just think that's, the, that's me. That's a culmination of me, like nineties, like late nineties, uh, humor and horror is like, that's why I love scream is my favorite movie. But, um, yeah, man, it's just, everything that I like. I'm a very like religious person also I love Jesus but I also love that side because I like to explore you know the dark side as well so I think it's uh it's cool it's like a it's kind of um what is the word a contradiction like my whole lifestyle is a contradiction but um and, and I guess that's why I like it so much it's interesting because I went to a Catholic school and I remember they canceled the Halloween parades that we used to have at our Catholic school because Parents were complaining and saying, oh, this is the devil's holiday. Kids are dressing up in these violent costumes. It's crazy how horror yeah, kind of just. I agree. I agree with those parents. We need more good parents like that. We have too many bad parents running around, little badass kids running around. Oh, no. More, bad, more good parents like that. Now. <laughs> <laughs> probably, some, probably harvest uh, harvest day or whatever most churches call it. I don't know what it's called. Something harvest. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, call it that and let them dress up, man. Just don't, don't dress up as a. Uh, little sluts all right yeah. <laughs> why you little kids <laughs> that's for boys and girls oh uh, so we got the horror movies that was your love of horror what was the one that scared you the most as a child <sighs> i mean i mean freddie did did uh, even though it was funny it, it like it scared me but um i'm trying to think of the ones that like really like i couldn't 
in the mouth of madness by john carpenter it was a mm-hmm. very like i watched that as a um i guess i was like watching it as like a teenager and but and it was just me and my friend justin who we would watch we went to video store this was like before block or there was a blockbuster but in my town there was no blockbuster it was a very like <laughs> mom and pop video store so we went through the whole entire horror section watching pretty much every horror movie and uh john carpenter's the mouth of madness he had to turn it off and like go home man i don't know and it's not you should watch it now it's not even that like intense or anything it's just very creepy like this old man uh like riding down riding down a highway it just i don't know man it did something to our brain and then also uh, even like blair witch project like seeing that in theater kind of messed me up driving home because i lived in a wooded i guess around a wooded area and it definitely messed with me um something that i saw like i guess more recently uh netflix there was something called the uh what was it the abcs of horror i believe mm-hmm. and like each letter they did or no vhs vhs 2 okay there's okay. vhs 1 and vhs 2 which is kind of like a found footage movie a compilation kind of movie vhs 2 there's one that was filmed i believe in thailand it was some asian country and it's about like a boarding school that turns into like this demonic thing. I had to, that's one thing I almost had to turn off myself because uh, it gets so intense and it just feels dark in general. It feels like when I step off the plane in Las Vegas, a dark energy that I don't want to deal with. You know what I'm saying? It's one of those kind of things. So you maybe check that out, VHS2. That was one, maybe the last one that kind of shook me to my core. Yeah, I saw the first VHS and I think I've seen part of the second one in my college dorm my freshman year, but I'm not into those found footage films. Paranormal Activity, not a fan of that. Blair Witch, I wasn't a fan of that as well. I know people are probably shocked that that is, I'm just not for it with everyone screaming and you don't see anything, even though horror movies, what makes them is the fact that you can't see what's going on. But for some reason, I just couldn't get into Blair Witch. I like it. Well, it was definitely a more of an experience um, in a, in the theater. And then also nothing had been uh, put out like that really no. before. Like, utilizing a website, utilizing um, having the act. Well, I guess Cannibal Holocaust, they did this where the actors had to go in hiding for like a year. So you didn't know if they were really alive or dead. And they kind of did that with Blair Witch. Like the, the, the actors weren't really seen out in public before the, the, the film came out. So you really thought that this could have possibly been real. Um, so that's kind of what the hook was with that one, but I agree. Yeah. Some of this stuff has gone over time. I kind of like the, uh, paranormal activity. I think it's, it's better than I thought it was going to be because it was hyped. I saw it after the fact, like not when it was in the theaters. And so I was like, ah, oh, yeah, I mean, it's corny. But then when I sat and watched it, I'm like, it's, it's done very, done very well, like for the budget that they had. Um, I like it, this stuff way better than the like kind of, uh, splat pack, uh, era of like, horror or what is it called torture porn torture horror. we're talking about hostile hostel, yeah all that kind of stuff except yeah, i'm not into that either the only one i love from splat pack is rob zombie i love all rob zombie films house of a thousand corpses that's Devil a classic Death, two are like my favorites for sure i'm not big on rob zombie his remakes i think he should stick to his own storyline he yeah. he butchered halloween in like my halloween, opinion halloween one but in halloween two when he took liberties i'm trying to make like michael myers mother uh, like something in his head that was guiding him and all this other stuff like that was I don't know I felt like he was trying to be it's like when RZA th- did uh, you know Wu-Tang Forever after the original Enter the 36 Chambers where he was just using samples he knew what he did it was very gritty and grimy I feel like that was kind of like Rob Zombie but then when he got money and was able to use things RZA got keyboards and didn't want to pay samples and wanted to keep the money and started using just keyboard sounds and all that it just didn't sound like Wu-Tang you know what I mean I feel like it's the same thing with Rob Zombie yeah, uh, it's similar to hip hop in a way in which it is. We'll get into the horror corner in a minute here, but the paranormal era is kind of to me the trap era in hip hop. That's the mainstream thing right now. The Conjuring's all over the place. Annabelle's all over the place. Everything's a ghost movie now. I want the slashers back. That's the that's the boom back to me is the slashers. Oh, I love you know obviously I love slash slashers are always going to be my favorite. I feel I feel like that's what a horror movie is. I don't. A horror movie to me is not a psychological thriller. It's like a be- it's like a seven foot being that is not real that you know is not real, but like yo, this is terrifying. You know what I'm saying? And not sci-fi, nothing else. It's just like this person is evil and they want to kill you. I feel like that's what a horror movie is. So I agree for sure. Did The Exorcist scare you as a kid? Never saw it as a kid. I saw it later on in life, and yes, it's it's, it's scary just because of the 
I kind of knew about the what happened around the film, people dying, people getting sick and everything else. Um, and I feel like there maybe was a little uh, outside forces playing with the just the, the making of that movie in general. Like, I feel like the devil did want that movie to get out and it kind of increased his presence in the, in the universe. Wow. I've never heard someone say that you think that's that the devil wanted that movie out into the universe. And so the he could. Devil, the devil is a like uh, PR machine, man. He wants as <laughs> much publicity as no publicity. No publicity is bad publicity for sure with the devil. <sighs> I was never afraid of The Exorcist for some reason. I saw it when I was eight years old. It was on TV because my grandfather was nuts. He used to let me watch all these horror movies. And my, I remember my mother going to me, he's going to need to pay for your psychiatric therapy. But I remember I saw The Exorcist and I was never bothered by it. The only movie that I could think of that bothered me after I saw it when I was younger was Orphan because I just was so screwed up in the head from it because you couldn't believe that this was actually a grown old woman. <laughs> yeah. And as a performing as a child. Right, man. Uh, dude, there's so many like indie uh, films that I've seen in the last few years too that are a little disturbing, especially like, um, what is it? Hereditary, Hereditary yeah. And also yeah. Midsommar, um, and just and also stuff from like Ty West. A T, I think that's how he said his name. Ti Ty West mm -hmm. uh, has done some stuff too that's really dope. Um, so yeah, man. There's a lot of like just like there's still like some artists that are keeping traditions alive and making good music. Same thing with, with films and horror movies in general. Yeah. I agree with that. Who's your all time slasher? Uh, director or character or character. What? Um, if I had to pick somebody, Oh man, I'm going to go with Jason for sure. Out of, out of, uh, anybody. I think he's, that's, that's the face of horror, even though people would say Michael Myers, I mean, Freddie, I think it's too comical for which I really like, but I don't think he represents horror, the genre in general with the comedy. Um, and I think Michael Myers was never aggressive enough for me. Um, I feel like Jason was like, that's it. You have no reason. Like, dude, it's about revenge and he's just coming for you and there's nothing you can do to stop it. So getting into horrorcore now is that horror took its own lane in hip hop, as you saw with the Gravediggers did. You saw what Cool Keith did in the 90s. What was your favorite horrorcore hip hop album of all time? Let me see if I, oh, I don't have my phone on me. Well, anyway, my phone wallpaper is the Gravedigger's first album. Oh, so, Six Feet that, Deep? Yeah, Six Feet Deep. It's actually called something else, but I can't say it. It wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> they weren't allowed to call it that in the uh, United States. Look it up if you guys want to check out the Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, man, uh, that album is my favorite horrorcore album of all time. It's probably the first, well, not the first one I heard because I heard like Ghetto Boys before that. And so my oh, friend yeah. Justin, bad little boy, he had an older brother that he was able to listen to all that, uh, that parental advisory music growing up. So when I go over to his house, we'd hear, I, like also, I think actually before Grave Diggers, I heard Bone Thugs, Mr. Ouija had come out on their EP before their album had come out. And that was kind of like my real after mine playing tricks on me ghetto boys that was like the next song that was really like whoa what are these are these guys conjuring some the devil or some spirits or something like what is happening here and then when i heard like diary of a madman um grave diggers mm -hmm. it's like dude this is it and then after that flatliners came out which was red rum was a rapper on there who was like russell simmons nephew um and they had an album called under satan's authority usa <laughs> and dude I was like, this is mind blowing. But yeah, that whole, that whole era, it was a very like little era. Maybe I would say maybe 92, but definitely like 93 up through 96, I would say of where even like just mainstream rappers were had to have like a kind of like more horror based song on their, on the max with Damien. Oh, of course. Yeah, man. Well, DMX, I guess he could almost be considered a hardcore rapper just because of the themes that he always talks about. Even Eminem, um that's right for sure um so yeah man i thought that was a, that was a great time and, and you know i'm waiting for that i think we we missed it a little bit i, mean, I don't know if we're going to talk about like current stuff now but i think we we kind of missed that chance for it to come back in around the 2013 2012 13 like when asap mob first came out like there was people were into very like dark imagery but more so with like the way they were dressing and everything else i'm like oh man we're about to go back into this era it's about the horror movies are about to be popping but 
I don't know, man. It never really, I think people love smoking hookah and looking at strippers too much. We just never got into that and people weren't too oppressed. I have no idea. That was going to be my next question. Why do you think that it's not as popular as it once was? Because it took a lane of its own. It has a cult following, of course. I'm sure it's mainly horror fans, but it, it's out there because you had the mainstream artists that did it, Eminem and DMX. Mm-hmm. Uh, why did it never take off or why has it not reemerged? It just hasn't resurfaced. Okay. Uh, yeah, man, I don't think too many people. It's a very niche um market when you look back at it now but back then it wasn't it was like these these videos were being played on like bt and mtv and on the radio even some of them well dmx and eminem of course were being played on the radio but like just in general that market was very like for dudes i don't remember a lot of like female grave diggers fans and stuff. <laughs> I think record labels they kind of understood what you know it was cool for the time but this is not making us any money and what's the point of getting behind this um and then people just kind of stopped being um, in that mind state. I just feel like right before the Jiggy era of like 97, 98, when Puff Daddy started taking the shiny 80s, suits. Yeah, that shiny suit era, I guess you want to call it, is uh, that's people started enjoying, you know, rich people things, I guess. I don't know, man, like brand names and like that's that's what they aspired to get it wasn't about just letting off frustration and talking about problems they had and making art and I feel like that's that was the last you know kind of generation of that was the hardcore stuff and then now it was more so portraying a character or like a lifestyle that you wanted to aspire to, to get to you know what I mean so I don't know man people never kind of fell back on that that rugged side I don't know would DJ Wonder produce a horrorcore hip hop album? If I produce an album, it would be horrorcore. No, I, I mean, <laughs> I some elements of it. I love it. Like, I do have a release that came out on Fool's Gold Records. Fool's Gold is uh, DJ A Track's label. Um, and him and Catch Dubs have this label, Nick Catch Dubs. And uh, I put it out around Halloween uh, a couple, many years ago. I don't know, was it 2013 maybe? And um, it's called. Uh, belief in the occult and i kind of use the beginning of if you watch the, the video of michael jackson's thriller in the beginning michael jackson had to put a card that said he wasn't affiliated with the occult he didn't believe in it he just you know he liked the imagery or whatever for his video but he didn't believe in any of this stuff so i kind of use that as the album cover for that you guys should check it out it's on my website djwonder.com you could also just look it up dj wonder belief in the occult and there's a couple of songs on there, or at least one that has uh, rappers on it. So you kind of see like what a what a in hardcore album that I would produce might sound like. Which artist right now do you think would be best on a horrorcore track? Well, there's actually, they just put out the Saw soundtrack for uh, the Book of Saw, Spiral, the Book of Saw or whatever it is, um, which Chris Rock produced. It came out this Friday, I think. Um, and 21 Savage is on there, has a song called Spiral, and he actually sounds really good on it. And I feel like he's been dabbling with that imagery for sure. Um, Young Nudie actually just on Monday had an album release for Dr. Evil, he called his album. And it was, he did a, a haunted house um, and it was like a one night only event and you had to wear all black and this was in uh, Georgia. And uh, I was like, dude, this is really innovative and that's really dope. It made me want to listen to that album whenever I can get my hands on it. It was like an album listening event. Um, and I feel like some of those guys are like leaning into that more hardcore imagery because it's like hip hop when I grew up, it was like something that, I, you know, you didn't want to mess with a lot of people. Like you really, the stuff that they were talking, even like Mob Deep, like you didn't know how tall they were, or like what they, but when you would hear their voices on, uh, album you'd like oh i'm never messing with these guys ever like now like i'm not intimidated by any rappers you know what i mean like i mean i guess they're they're much more uh they're much more quick to shoot you in the head i guess because they're, <laughs> they're like 100 100 pounds soaking wet but uh i'm not intimidated by looking at any of them or whatever being around any of them whatever they seem like just it is what it is um but i feel like digging into that like psycho imagery like kind of 21 Savage, like i'm a sick dude like this is what i'll do you blah 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 like all that stuff i think is kind of interesting so i think he might be maybe one of the closest people to a hardcore mainstream rapper there are still hardcore is still going man they're still like the you know insane clown posse has kept it going by all of their offshoot brand uh of people that do like the gathering of juggalos there's like twisted and yeah, twisted a couple other people on their label and then also like ill bill psycho 
um, necro psychopathic psychopathic records, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of like he has a couple people on that, a um, couple artists on that. So there's still that like and in definite other countries like Australia, there's like some really hardcore hardcore people, but it's just too much for me. It's almost like cannibal corpse, like death metal. <laughs> imagery coming from hip-hop and it's still out there man i don't know you just got to go find it just like everything else i guess what's your favorite thing to do during the october season since you are a horror guy oh man that's my favorite my favorite season man I yeah can, um, same dude all i do is uh go to haunted attractions i love to go to them around the country like when i dj other cities i'll look up and see like what haunted houses are open or whatever. <laughs> even like not even just october like Right now, if I was going to like Detroit or going to Colorado, I'd see what kind of like uh, 365 day a year um, haunted attractions they have. Like uh, where I'm at in Miami, there's one in Wynwood, Paranoia that's open now in um, Orlando at Old Town. There's one that's open, um, you know, year round. So I always look for those. Um, but October, definitely. I used to always take a road trip from New York City down to visit my parents in Delaware and we'd stop in New York City and then philadelphia all the attractions around there and then end up like lower delaware the ones that are in like fields and forests and stuff like that so i love doing that um i've been going to universal studios halloween horror nights pretty much last couple of years i didn't get to go last year obviously it was supposed to be the 30th year anniversary and they shut it down baby because of the old rona yeah. um, so i think this year is probably going to be next level because they had to make up for last year um so i'll definitely probably be doing that this year for sure too I definitely want to get out of the house. I'm tired of being cooped up and with COVID and all, but as someone who is DJing in the clubs and that's what who, you love doing that DJ in the nightlife. How's it been during this time since you're not Stuck. able to really do it? It sucks, man. Mad people are depressed. I was depressed for sure. Like I need interaction, social interaction. Like I need it. You know what I mean? And I've been able to kind of like learn new skills and stuff and been able to get on Twitch and, find a new audience and learn new skills to be able to be on like this. I never would have been able to do this stuff or like create like a, a space within the internet. You know what I mean? Without last year, just kind of having to study things. But so it's been good in that, that side, but dude, I was ready for everything to open up. We would have shut down in maybe like April. I was ready for things to open last May. So people now celebrating May, 2021, like, yes. Or I'm like, dog, Get out of here, man. Just go live your life. We, we, we've been, we wanted this reaction last May. You should have been wilding out in the streets and demanding this last May because I don't know how much, how much stuff has changed too much. People got a shot in their arm and they think they're invincible now or something. Whatever, dude. If that makes you <laughs> go ahead. If this is going to help you open clubs up or if your particular political party is getting a bad rap so you decide to open up the entire country so you don't look bad, sure, go ahead, my friend. Whatever it takes to get us back out because I've seen so many DJs finally happy again, man. There's a bunch of little sissies, man, this whole past year, like sitting around contemplating their life's worth. I get it, man. They have all their eggs in one basket. It is what it is, but now they're finally back to it. But don't dunk on people. Don't act like don't act like you're all good now. Be don't don't act like I don't remember the things you were talking about and crying about for the last year. I remember. I, I you you were a little sissy for a little while, my friend. Um, but I'm just happy that people are happy now and people are out. So it's all good. I I, I like I like that everything's opening back up now. It's. It's getting back to normalcy a little bit. Did you get the shot? Huh? Yeah, of course. You got the yeah, shot? Sure, yeah. Yeah, because there's a lot of people out here still <laughs> refusing to get their shots. And Damn, you're the first person that ever asked me that. I got I to gotta get my answer down better. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, I have it. Sure, please. Will you let me on the plane now? Yes, yeah. I, oh, oh I, don't, I don't have my card with me. Oh, I don't have my card with me. You just let me on, please? Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> All right, does it sound convincing? All right, yeah, yeah. I got it, man. Sure. Oh, uh, yeah, because a lot of people are still not convinced that this shot works. Some people believe that it's government control. People think that this you'll see these fake Instagram videos of people's face either <laughs> going Bell's crooked. That was palsy thing. Yeah, it, it sucks, man. Um, listen, I don't know if it is fake or not. I just know I always told my grandmother. She actually wrote this in a book for me. My grandmother, um, when I was a kid, like I guess my mom had given her a book to kind of like write this stuff down for your grandson for like, you know, so he kind of knows about you, you know and whatever and one of the things she wrote in there is like never get the mark of the beast and i didn't understand what it was i'm like what are you talking about like don't get any tattoos and i'm like okay cool i don't have any tattoos but i'm kind of understanding what she was saying she said never get the mark of the beast so look that up man and just think about that 
Mm -hmm. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. In your time with your horror attractions and going around the country, have you been to Salem? I'm pretty sure you probably have been. No, dude. You haven't been? I've wow. Been you two, two places that I've never been that you might have think I, have, I have, would have been the first place I've been to. Never been to Salem, and I was close to Massachusetts. I should have been there. Um, and then I've never been to New Orleans. Wow. So two places I want to visit are definitely there. Maybe I'll do that this – if I can get booked, I'd love to go to both of those places this this October, this season, you know. Yeah, you got to head down to Salem when you got a chance because, well, especially during the Halloween season, because that's when I used to go. But it's Halloween Town down there. Oh yeah, dude, that's that's my dream. I love it. I, I yeah. gotta go. I gotta. Go. <laughs> I heard the Halloween Horror Nights is going to have a Texas Chainsaw Maze this year in Halloween Three. Oh, dude. Well, listen, I used to be so. All I used to listen to were Halloween Horror Nights. Um podcasts like year round i'll be listening first i like i would listen to the lead up to like we maybe think this house and then the actual announcements of the houses and then the first night that they would be like this is our review of the houses without spoilers and stuff and then i wouldn't listen until i actually went and then i would go back and listen to their reviews and stuff. so i was like year round listening to these but then this last year man everybody everybody became a bunch of punks man about like, this whole thing. <laughs> like well i guess it is okay that they shut down the the whole entire parks and didn't do this on their 30th anniversary so i'm like dog i'm not listening to you anymore man i have no respect for you right now so maybe i gotta creep back into that um just so i can see what the announcements are gonna be but i love texas chainsaw massacre and any kind of like haunted house that i've been to with a texas chainsaw theme has always been very scary and like that's what a haunted house should kind of be made up of so that'll be dope Oh, I agree. It's one of the greatest films of all time. Toby, Toby Hooper is, he's an iconic legend for that film, as it, we all know. Part, is it part three or part one? Which one, which one did you say? Part one. Halloween oh, part three one. is oh, going to be the one. Three. Who, who is it? Halloween three season of the witch? Dude? Mm -hmm. what, are, what are they going to do? People's heads exploding? Yeah. From, <laughs> like, I don't know. what. That's not a great one. I've been, yeah, I don't know about that, but unless they make it, you know, they find ways to make things scary, or maybe that'll just be kind of like a nostalgic house, which they, they had like a poltergeist house with the last one that I went to, and that was really dope, and it was also scary, but so maybe they'll find a way to make it cool. I don't they got to bring back the house of a thousand corpses, me, too. That was my favorite one that I went to um, the last time I went, 2019, um, and they had a, they also had a Rob Zombie uh, scare zone that you walk through that played nothing but um hellbilly deluxe i believe mm -hmm. um and dude that was a crazy little area for sure just think that universal pictures originally was going to be releasing house of a thousand corpses and they kicked it off they yeah. didn't want nothing to do with it and then they have his maze in there that's a for great, halloween like justice for rob zombie i guess yeah, yeah it is he, he comes strutting back into the office like well 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 look who it is yeah. how you want me <laughs> it's like mike jones baby back then they didn't want me you know what yeah. I'm saying? Now he's hot exactly oh. i'm sure that you've attended a few horror conventions in your lifetime met some horror actors ah oh, dude have a no nah, i've been to more comic cons i guess and they people have been there but i did have a chance to go to one that's in Orlando every year, but I didn't go because it was like 40 or 50 bucks to get in. I was like, man, is it that serious? I, but I've gotten to meet a lot of horror actors just through the morning show. Anytime back when we were in studio, anytime that there was some kind of iconic like actor that had been in a horror movie that me and my friend DB like liked, we pushed to get them booked. Like sometimes Sway would be like, nah, I don't even know who this person is, but we like, yo, we'll take over the interview. It's all good. Just come on. Let's just book them. And we'd have them on. We had like, um, who is it? Uh, from The Exorcist. What's her name? Linda Blair. Linda Blair, exactly. Wait, so her, I didn't know I, who Linda Blair was. Yeah, he, he definitely no. He knew he knew Linda Blair because she I think okay. came out with like Rick James or something. That's and, right. Mm -hmm. And that, that he kind of knew that whole folklore. And he obviously he knew The Exorcist, but no, like and then some like more like Kiefer Sutherland we wanted because we love Lost Boys. Like any of those like eighties movie, any eighties horror movies, any of the main actors or actresses from there, we'd always love to have on. So I've gotten to meet a lot of them. Uh, just from the show, and that's been a blessing for sure. And they're nice people too. You people seem to seem to think that all oh, because they do these violent horror movies that they're terrible people, but they're not. Nah, even even like even Rob Zombie, like I met him, he's one of the funniest dudes, like just a great guy, man. So 
for sure. I don't know, they don't don't think they're really like their persona, but maybe deep down inside they are. You know, yeah, maybe <laughs> Marilyn, Marilyn Manson style, baby. It's all coming out. Who knows? Oh, uh, we're, we're hearing the news and the stories about him. I mean, they even did a song with DMX, The Omen, back in the day, off of Flesh of My Flesh, Blood of My Blood. <sighs> These horror fans, I'll tell you though, first time I went to a horror convention, I. I, I I looked at myself and said, am I really a part of these people? Because some of them are just, oh boy. I mean, we're talking about grown men carrying saw dolls in their hands like they're babies. Yeah, I mean, that's Comic Cons, that's Star Trek conventions, that's any kind of convention really with like cosplay or like furries and all that stuff. People have their hobbies and they really get into it, man. Um, and usually most people these days keep their private lives on the internet and they have their little bulletin boards or post on Reddit or whatever. And that's how they. But when you see these people in real life, it's an <laughs> eye-opening experience, man. Oh, boy. Yeah, I went to one of these Comic-Cons up in Connecticut or horror, was it horror, CT Horror Fest I went to and the people in there, I was just like, what a bunch of freaks. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably looking at you like, look at this guy, he doesn't even dress up. Huh? Yeah, no, what I went, I think I went in a... I went in my Wayne Corbett jersey and a pair of Air Forces. I said, I think I'm dressed too normal for this. You had people dressed up in costumes. Oh, you're you're dressed up as the Hofstra University uh, stalker. Yeah, <laughs> for women in the lunchroom, Wayne Corbett. That was a good. That was a good outfit. Oh yeah, <laughs> I never knew that about Wayne Corbett. So that's don't, don't tell anybody. No, I won't. But that's crazy about him. Growing up, I'm gonna assume that you were a Ravens fan. Is that who you follow? Yeah, if I had to pick a team, it would be the Ravens. Because um, I was at Baltimore, like I said, was pretty much the closest city to where I grew up. Big Ray Lewis fan? Of any Raven, yes. Big Ray Lewis fan, for sure. I'm not, I'm not like a sports guy. I was baseball, like 90s. I had My baseball card collection is crazy. My comic book collection is crazy. But I was into baseball. Uh, I, could, I knew most of the players. After, like... Like when I got into high school and started getting into like skateboarding, I dropped all knowledge of sports and I haven't ever gone back. I have no idea who's on any team now. I don't even know expansion teams. I don't know teams <laughs> that have switched from American League to National League on baseball. Or I have no idea. So I'm not a big sports dude. Mm-hmm. Even though I know I'm on the Mad Max sports experience, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oriole fan. I, I know that you're probably an Oriole fan. Yeah. If I had to pick a team, I would pick the O's. Yeah. Even though I'm wearing this thing, I just like the colors. Mm-hmm. Dr. Dre, Dr. Dre tribute hat, I guess you can call it. You're a fitted collector. Yeah, man. Covering up my head. So I had to be a fitted, um, a fitted guy, I guess. Well, snapback guy, not fitted anymore because you get a little more wear on the snapbacks. Just a you, little tip for you people. I you, you do. Aren't snapbacks better than fitted? In my opinion, they are. I mean, just because when you sweat and even your head expands in general, sometimes uh, a fitted gets stretched out and it's never the same. And you look like a weirdo uh, snapback. You can bring it in by one little notch. Looks good as new. That's my, that's been my experience. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite hat that you have or the rarest one? The rare. Oh, mm, well, the ones that I make, I make one of ones uh, <laughs> and I make them <sighs> for, like my friends and stuff too. I've, I've been I've been on my like Chateau Marmont uh, phase and I have, I have one that's called the Chateau Wonder. If you go to djwonder.com slash store, you could check it out. The Chateau Wonder hat and has an animal status logo on the side of it there. But um, so I love those. Those are like the rarest ones that I have. But uh, maybe I have a New York Mets, the the color of like a San Francisco Giants. Like it's black with an orange New York Mets logo that mm-hmm. the snapback, which you can't. You know what that is? I'm going to tell you what that is right now. It, it, that's the New York Giants because the New York Giants moved to San Francisco. There you go. Well, so you got just so like people, the Brooklyn Dodgers and the LA Dodgers. Moved to and, LA. Yeah. yeah. I get it, man. I should have known that. See my sports knowledge. Yeah. Um, but yeah, dude, everybody's looking for that snapback version. I got it from 125th Street. Oh, Hollywood. check it out on Hatland.com. They got it. They do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, because I look because I one of my friends asked for it and I looked on there and I could, all I could find is the fitted version. So I have to check it. So everybody looking, yeah, go to Hatland. They have it. Yeah, they got this. <laughs> they got this. Trust me, I'm I'm into the hat game right now, so I'm I'm on the prowl for them. DJ Wonder, I want you to let my audience know anything that you have coming up. Do you have any virtual shows and interviews? And of course, you do your podcast and your show at 10 p.m. tonight on Sirius XM on Wednesdays. Is there anything else you want to let the audience know about yourself and your shows and any events that you have coming up? 
yeah, check me out on Twitch, man. If you want to see this beautiful face, DJ some records. You're mostly just talk, and then I play records in between my talking. Twitch.tv slash DJ Wonder. That's Monday through Thursday, 7 p.m. Eastern. Monday through Thursday, 7 p.m. Or you can just subscribe, and a notice will come up when I'm on live. Um, Twitch.tv slash DJ Wonder. Also, please subscribe on YouTube.com slash DJ Wonder. Twitch and YouTube is free to subscribe, man. Just hit that button. And you're all good. YouTube.com slash DJ Wonder. And then for social media, it's everything at DJ Wonder. I'd love to see you on Instagram. That's probably where I'm most active. Twitter, sometimes. I don't feel like dealing with your any of your opinions and views. So I really don't go on there too much. But I'm on Twitter at DJ Wonder. And then DJWonder.com is the hub for everything. If you want to look at old episodes of uh, live streams that I've done. If you want to check out uh, all kinds of stuff. The new podcast will be on there. DJWonder.com. That's pretty much where you can find me. Go check it out. Go check out everything they just said. DJWonder.com. Go subscribe to his YouTube channel. Follow him on Instagram and Twitter. DJ Wonder, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, t- anytime you're welcome on, of course. Shout out to your manager, Rowan. She's a beast. Rowan. Yeah, man. We love Rowan. Mez Entertainment. If you're a, a hungry artist of any uh, kind of specialty, whether you're a rapper, a producer, DJ, model, anything, looking for management, and you fit the criteria, you you can be uh, a part of Mez Entertainment. Go check them out. I'm sure she'll check your portfolio and see if you're worthy to be part of the team. But yeah, <laughs> Ryan's dope, man, for sure. Oh, man. Thank you again for coming on the show. I want you to take care. Enjoy the rest of your night. Everyone tune in to Sirius XM in the mornings for Sway in the morning as he's the DJ and producer of the show and for his shows at 10 p.m. Eastern Wednesday nights and lots of good content on the way. DJ Wonder, enjoy the rest of your day. You're always Thank welcome. You, man. It was mad fun. And I'm glad you are, you're very knowledgeable. So it's dope to always talk to somebody that has passion for these things, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too.